Welcome to Native Badaskwe, Native News Online's weekly spotlight on people making news in leading change in Indian country. My name is Levi Rickert, publisher and editor of Native News Online. I'm joined today with a special guest, Jana Schmieding. Jana, why don't you come on, uh, come on here? And Jana is a tribal citizen of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe located in South Dakota, although she grew up in Oregon, if I got that right. And uh, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yes. And joining us today is Neely Bardwell, who is on staff here at Native News Online, and she'll be asking questions as well. And we are uh, going to ask, let me ask you the first question. Now, Jana, when did you discover you were funny? At what age? <laughs> I don't know when I discovered that I was funny. It's sort of like, uh, I, I just kind of really always loved to laugh and uh, very much um, like clung to the funny people in my family. And it's hard to find uh, an unfunny person in my family, but uh, I was just really attracted to humor and comedy um, and, and people who are funny. Um, throughout my entire life. But I was kind of like a shy person, you know, growing up. I was a little introvert. Um, and it wasn't until I really started to study performing arts in high school and college that I like sort of embraced my uh, my own comedy and, and start to, started to really like pursue it as, a, as an art. Well, that's great. And, you know, among Native people, we always laugh about our Indian humor. And I know, I have cousins. I was actually class clown in high school, so we always had fun laughing. And, and I, I go to national Indian conferences, Native American conferences. And we have a good time laughing. So something to be said about the Indian humor. Hey, Neely, what's uh, what's your question for Jana? Yeah. So my question is: I saw that Rutherford Falls season two um, aired on Peacock. Um, and so what I was wondering is if you could tell us a little bit about what we can expect from season two, because I, um, what I found and what I saw, because I, I saw that the season two is highly anticipated. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, what, can, what can we expect? Like, what can you tell us about season two? Season two is a really funny season of our show, um, whereas season one, we sort of created the world of Rutherford Falls and these friendships and the relationships and um, these characters, both the Rutherford Falls characters and also the Minashanka Nation characters. Um, and, uh, and we, you know, use that season to discuss really big thematic issues like history, indigenous history um, versus colonial history, um, statues, uh, statue removal, and um, essentially identity. Um, and now that we sort of created that world in season one, in season two, we're really playing with it. And we're like diving very deep into these characters, these characters' lives and their experiences. Um, so you can anticipate, you can look forward to in season two, um, an episode about pretendians. We have an episode that's a Halloween episode. We have an episode about Regan trying to um, uh, get a home site on her traditional homelands and having to navigate tribal bureaucracy. Um, uh, we have an, ish, uh, an episode where uh, Terry and Regan um, are consultants on a um, on a contemporary Western TV show. <laughs> so uh, there's just a lot of really fun sort of shenanigans that happen in season two. Yeah, it seems like these are all like very real and pertinent issues. I can tell, I was wondering, um, or when I was reading about it, I was reading that the main premise of season one was the statue removal. And that reminded me of how, you know, during COVID and during the George Floyd riots, um, everybody was taking down these Confederate statues. And so that's what it reminded me of. Um, so my next question is, you know, how you yourself, like how are you able to portray these issues that are important to you, these advocacy issues through the show? 
Um, well, I'm a writer as well on the show, so I get to um, work alongside our the other Native writers on this show and, you know, the non-Native writers on the show in um, sort of exploring our own worlds and our own experiences as Native people in our culture. And we um, get a really good opportunity to do that this season. Um, and I think it's just really exciting for me as a Native performer and writer to be exploring um to be exploring these characters and and their their lives and their inner lives and to even to be able to play um a native woman who is really ambitious about her career and you know she has romance and love in her life and things that we have never really seen on tv um depicted um it's just really exciting for me to be able to uh step into this role and to um you know take this character on many of the same journeys that i've had in my own life um and to be a relate relatable character for native women to uh see on tv well jenna i think it's an exciting time for native americans on television tell us tell us what you, how did this happen what's happening right now with the success of Rutherford Falls and the success of Res Dogs. What, what do you think is happening, and what do you what do you is it is it going to continue? It's absolutely going to continue, and I'll tell you why. Um, what has happened is there have been generations of Native talent, both in front of the camera and behind the camera, who have been sort of leading this charge and paving a way for um, my generation of. Um, uh, writers and producers. And um, so Sterling Harjo, the um, creator of Reservation Dogs, and Sierra Teller Ornelas, the um, creator of Rutherford Falls, they have both been, you know, working their way up in this industry and working on their own projects independently. Sierra has been a TV writer for over 10 years and Sterling Harjo, as you know, has been, you know, making independent films for years and years. So everybody has been in their own way, sort of um, pushing and grinding and and working against uh, the, the system of erasure that has happened in our industry. And um, we're seeing breakthroughs now because uh, Sierra and Sterling specifically have gotten um, roles as executive producers so they sit at the creative helm of these tv shows and that wields a lot of power if uh, executive producers are able to make hiring decisions they're able to make creative decisions they're able to pull up young writers like myself um, and the other writers on their shows um, and they're able to cast um, they have the final say in casting so um through their leadership we we are seeing sort of this exciting wellspring of um, Native talent that is finally being celebrated in mainstream um, spaces. And of course, there's going to be more because they also are the kinds of leaders who um, anticipate seeing the people that they staff on their shows have their own shows eventually. Um, so there is an expectation from us that we will also become executive producers ourselves one day. That is so exciting. and and. Uh... As, as an older Native American, I'm, I have to be Potawatomi, I, I'm just really excited it's, it's to see this happening. Um, and, and you're exactly right, getting past some of those, those depictions that we were not really happy with in the past from Hollywood. So to tell us this, what kind of shifts were made this year? Are there more Native actors on the show this year? Um, the shifts that were made this year and this season on our show is, um, uh, we we still have, um, you know, a, a heavy amount of Native writers, Native producers um, on the show. And yeah, we're pulling in Native comedy talent from all over the country. So, you know, one thing that was um, challenging during the first season was we started um, our production during the early days of COVID-19. And so flying um, Native people in was a really unsafe thing to do. So we didn't, you know, we weren't able to sort of um, bring people from all the different tribal nations and all these um, um, comedians that we wanted to um, bring into the show. We were sort of um, 
for safety reasons, we wanted to make sure that we were hiring locally and we weren't bringing people into Hollywood and then sending them back to their, you know, tribal communities um, as, you know, a potential super spreader event. But this season we have um, a little bit more liberty. So we have guest stars like Ghani and Dia Horn, who um, from Ganawage, who is um, like the star of one of the stars of Letter Kenny. Um, we have Dallas Goldtooth um, this season, who plays Nelson, a curator at Regan's um, Museum, um, and we have you know, comedians, native comedians that we were bringing in and giving guest star roles. And, and that's something that is so fun and exciting about this season. I'm, I'm excited. As, as I said, I, I know Dallas and he, he's a funny man. I've known him for many years. So. Neely, what other question you have? I had a question because um, I remember watching The Office growing up and Ed Helms is the other um, character in the show. I have, the main question I had was what, what was it like working with him? Ed is such a kind and loving and compassionate, um, castmate. I mean, I consider Ed to be, um, a friend and, and, sort of a co-conspirator he is an ally to native folks and um you know he's been honored in ways um from the native community that i don't think he expected and it's really lovely to see him get like blanketed and you know gifted and people from our own communities um you know, seeing Ed in a different way. Um, uh, we love him from The Hangover. We love him from The Office, but now we get to love him in this way um, and see him as an ally to our communities. And, um, and you know, he plays sort of um, this white guy who is learning. He's learning about his own identity and he's learning about his his white privilege and his positionality sort of in this community and, and through his friendship with Regan. And um, in many ways, I, I think it's like really lovely that Ed, the person um, will is willing to put himself in this character that's very vulnerable to critique and criticism. You know, it's like, um, that's to me, that is a really loving act. Um, as a performer to be able to do that. And um, I just really respect him and I really, I just love him. He's also so funny and so cool to work with. I just can't believe, I cannot believe that I get to call Ed Helms my colleague. It's strange. <laughs> so it sounds like you're having fun in this show. Oh yeah, nothing <laughs> but fun. Yes. So you, you talk about allies and certainly Native Americans need allies. Uh, Tell us this. I know Dallas was very played a very integral part out at Standing Rock. What? What? How? How do you think this has helped your stardom? Has helped? Is helping you perhaps being more involved socially for Native American issues that are out there right now? Um, you know, I try. I try not to center my voice in those spaces because I know that there are other people who are doing much more effective work than me, you know, really boots on the ground and people like Dallas, who is such a powerful activist and advocate. And I see my role more um, as being able to use the spotlight, the, the, the little spotlight that I have to bring others with me and um, to make sure that I'm using my my uh, platform to amplify other Indigenous folks who need that amplification, um, uh, yeah, I think it's it's just part of the part of who I am is is making sure that non-native uh, the non-native people in my life and in my community understand the indigenous experience and understand and recognize native identities in our culture and um and see us as whole people that are you know um rich with experience and knowledge well thank you for that answer uh jenna yeah each one of us have to embrace who we are as native people and use our use our uh, talents to amplify who we are as native people so i really appreciate that answer so 
Uh, another question I have is how how difficult was it to even sell the idea of Rutherford Falls in the beginning? Were you part of that process or do you know much about it? I was not part of that process. You would have to ask our showrunner, Sierra Teller Ornelas, but um, um, I really do believe that um, wider audiences, non-Native audiences in the industry, um, they do want to hear from Native people. We, we do want to, um, people want to know about the Native experience, um, but it's sort of like, folks don't know what they don't know, you know, and, and it takes like a, a, a few breakthroughs and a little bit of exposure to make them interested. And, and I think the exposure that the Standing Rock movement garnered as well as, um, you know, the, the indigenous movements that have happened since then um, have paved a, a, a special path for um, native media and and for the humanization of native people ultimately that that comedy br helps to bring to light um that not only are we um you know frontline workers and and you know huge advocates for the uh health and well-being for our nations and our communities but we are also you know um parents and um you know, you know, relatives and uh, dreamers and, you know, travelers and all of the things that we are, uh, that's, that's like sort of what comedy does for Native folks. It helps to show us um, as people who are thriving and, and are making jokes in hard times. I, I would agree with that. That's, I, to me, that's always been the beauty of Indian humor is, is uh, the, the old line is if, if, you, if you, you know, we don't want to sit around crying all the time. So we had to make those jokes and it was a part of our survival mechanism as far as I'm concerned historically. And so I'm so glad it's being amplified now on television and, and what a, what an opportunity for you, Jana, it's just wonderful. And uh, so what, what advice would you have for young kids who think they're funny and want to be a Jana? What would you tell them? <laughs> Find a way to perform, find a way to showcase your talent, whether it's on your phone, TikToks, um, or finding a stage where you can, you know, uh, rehearse your, your uh, comedy set. Um, we have the luxury of the internet. So I learned how to write comedy pilots by looking on Google and saying, how do you write a comedy pilot? Um, <laughs> and you can do the same for, um, you know, anything that you're interested in. Um, just finding a way to rehearse it with joy in your own life. Um, that's always been a part of my life is um, maintaining um, a relationship with my creativity and centering that relationship in my life at all times. And also collaborating with other people that are interested in the same stuff you are. Find those other comedy nerds in your life and, and just start making stuff with them. That's what I did. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. Neela, do you have one last question? Um, I, if we have time, obviously, I just had one last question. Um, sometimes for, you know, between actors, writers, and producers, there's some creative differences. I was just wondering if there was any, how did you, you know, work through that? Yeah, I think that creative differences are part of the process of creating anything. And um, I think that creative differences honestly make a, P, a con content stronger. Um, and we navigated any creative differences with love on our show. Um, uh, there aren't, there weren't a lot of like heavy creative differences on our show because I think we were all just so excited to like make it and to, to put everything forward. I think if anything, we were having a hard time narrowing down what we could show in our eight episodes. There was just like a, a lot of ideas and um, so much that we are excited to share with the world. Um, uh, so it, there wasn't really a lot of really juicy drama on our show, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but if there was at any point, you know, a conflict about how a story got told, like, um, I think we were all um, so willing to work with each other and, and find a resolution and, and find the best, funniest way to portray what we were 
trying to do at the end of the day on a comedy show it's you know comedy wins so whatever is the funniest answer is what goes on screen and, and funny is good as we native americans know that to our viewers we're going to show the trailer to this season two of Rather through falls that was released on thursday june 16th and all eight episodes are available on peacock Nathan, you've missed so much. The town's revamped my 18th birthday. I did send you that cameo from Olivia Rodrigo's horse. That horse did not phone it in. I love an animal who knows her angles. Regan, I really need your help. Nathan, yeah, a little bit of a rough patch. <laughs> but adversity makes us stronger. No, Reek, is this sweater too sexy? For what? What about a vest? Welcome to the new Minnesota Cultural Center. This is Nelson, my co-curator. You're touching those with bare hands? Would you want to be touched with hands covered in gloves? I don't know what I'm into, man. Nice to see you miss fish. I listened to that podcast about you. I have Josh's info if you want to dox him. Well, I find that troubling. Hey, Terry, Regan's in a rest fight. Oh, tell her if she gets ground, it's over. Listen, major after major, you're <laughs> Is bonker donkers. <laughs> Be sure to join us next week for another episode of Native Badasque. Thank you for joining us today, Jenna. Absolutely. Thank you, Thanks for having me. Yes. Thank you, everyone who's tuned in to the stream on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Thank you very much.